Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God here at the French Huguenot Church of Charleston. You bless God with your presence this morning. You bless each other with your presence this morning. And it is our hope that this time of worship is exactly what you need, not only for this moment, for this day, but for wherever you find yourself on your faith journey. I do hope that Thanksgiving was good to you all and that you had a little bit of leftover after the big meal so that you could continue in giving thanks. But it is good to be in this space together to give thanks to God for all of what God continues to give to us. If you would take a moment just to look at your worship guide, just point you to all the announcements we have going on. We, are, we very much welcome you if you are visiting with us, whether you might be visiting with family for the weekend and heading back home today, or in Charleston just as a tourist, or maybe just stumbled across this place walking down the street. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here to worship with us. Also, at the very beginning, at the front of the church, hopefully you saw the Advent devotional booklets. If not, don't run to get them now. Wait until after worship. But please grab one of these devotional booklets and take it home with you. Members of our congregation have written a devotional for each day during the season of Advent. One per day. Don't read them all at once, although I know you'll be tempted to. One at a time. Taking our time through the season of Advent. I, however, have read them all just to make sure that they're good and they are wonderful. And hopefully these will help prepare us for the coming of Jesus as we celebrate that on Christmas Day. Um, we will not have collation this after, after church today, but we do encourage you to hang around out front to say hey to folks, to give hugs, to give high fives, to whatever you need to do to continue to be the fellowship of God in this place. If you're interested in a tour of the church following worship, please come forward in front of the altar right after church. A member of our congregation will be happy to tell you more about this place and more about who we are as a gathered group of Huguenot Christians. This is a wonderful day to be together, to be the, wor to, to be the worshipful people of God. So let us worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Light this candle in hope. Hear God's promise of hope from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, found at page 601 of your pew Bibles. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up any sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
Let us pray. O Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we have come together for the public sanctification of this Lord's Day to offer unto Thee our praises and our prayers and to hear Thy Holy Word. Thou hast promised to hearken favorably unto all those who call upon Thee in the name of Thy Son. We therefore beseech Thee to look down upon us in mercy, to purify our thoughts and affections, that we may render unto Thee an acceptable service. Great God, we humble ourselves before Thee. We adore Thy majesty. We extol Thy wisdom, Thy power, and Thy goodness, which appear with such brightness in the marvelous works of creation and redemption. We acknowledge thy tender love and the manifold favor, spiritual and temporal, which we continually receive at thy hand. But we praise thee more especially with all Christians who are assembled this day, that thou didst send thy Son in the world to save us, and that he rose from the dead for our justification. We bless thee that thou hast given us by his glorious resurrection so lively a hope of everlasting life. O oh God, Thy glory is great in all thy churches, and the praise of thy name is heard in all the assemblies of thy saints. May our thanksgivings ascend unto thy throne. Make us worthy to be partakers of the resurrection of the just and of the glory of the kingdom of heaven, whither Jesus Christ is entered as our forerunner, where he liveth and reigneth, where he is adored and glorified with thee and the Holy Ghost. God bless it forever. Amen. Our first hymn is hymn number 425. You will find it in your supplement, verses 1 through 4, while shepherds watch their flocks. with reverence the Ten Commandments of the Law of God as they are written in the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus and found on page 5 in your liturgies. God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hear also what our Lord Jesus Christ saith in the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Dearly beloved, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yet if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore humbly confess our sins before God. You may be seated. O Lord God, eternal and almighty Father, we confess before thy divine majesty that we are miserable sinners, born in corruption and iniquity, prone to evil and of ourselves incapable of any good. We acknowledge that we transgress in various ways thy holy commandments, so that we draw down on ourselves through thy righteous judgment, condemnation, and death. We are, O Lord, under heartfelt sorrow for having offended thee, and we implore thy grace to relieve our wretchedness. Vouchsafe, O most gracious God and merciful Father, to have compassion on us in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Pardon our sins, give us the graces of the Holy Spirit, and increase them day by day, to the end that hardly acknowledging our unworthiness and forsaking our sins, we may be filled with that godly sorrow which worketh repentance unto salvation, and may bring forth fruits of righteousness acceptable to thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. First lesson is taken from Jeremiah chapter 33 verses 14 through 16. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it is called, The Lord is Our Righteousness. This endeth the reading. Our sermon hymn is number 213, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
Our second reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This endeth the lesson. service continues on page 10 in your liturgies. O Lord, let thy mercy shine upon us. O God, may clean our hearts within us. O Lord God, we render thanks unto thee that thou hast called us to the knowledge and profession of the Christian faith. We beseech thee to preserve and increase it in us to the end that continuing steadfast in the same, we may sincerely unite in the confession of the church universal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, he died, he was buried. He went into the place of departed spirits. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And thence we come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe the Holy Church universal, the communion of saints, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, creator and father of the human race, who has commanded that prayer and supplication be made for all humankind, we offer unto thee our intercessions for the peace of the world and for the happiness and salvation of all people. Deliver, we beseech thee, O Lord, from spiritual blindness all the nations that still sit in darkness. Thou didst so love the world that thou gavest thine only Son to die as a propitiation not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Thou hast taught us that he came to be a light unto, unto the Gentiles and to bring salvation unto the ends of the earth, and that there is none other name under heaven given among, among us mortals, whereby we may be saved. Grant, Almighty God and merciful Father, that all of our fellow citizens may be gathered unto the name of our Lord, to the end that all nations may know and adore Thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. O God of mercy, have pity on those who are suffering by war, pestilence, or any other scourge, and all who are in affliction. 
We commend to thy care the widow and the orphan, the poor and the stranger, all who are in peril by land or by water or by air, all who endure persecution for the gospel, all who are distressed in mind, the infirm, the sick, and the dying. Comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities and give them a happy issue out of all their trials and afflictions. Now, God, we ask that you hear our silent prayers. Favorably hear us, O God. Graciously hear all who at this time offered up their prayers unto thee. Reject not the supplications of thy servants, but grant us the blessings we have asked of thee and all others which are necessary for us through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we offer up our prayers. Amen. Our sermon hymn is hymn number 126. Breathe on me, breath of God. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Most of you are thinking, Woody, that's great, but it's Christmas time. No, it's not. It's the season of Advent. Season of Advent is four weeks that leads up to Christmas, December the 25th this year. It's four weeks of prayer, meditation, scripture study as we go through the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. It's a time to prepare us for the coming of Jesus it's a time to get us ready for the coming of our Savior. This morning, Glenda lit for us the first candle of our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. And some of you might look at that and say, oh, it is so good to have an Advent wreath in the sanctuary. It feels like church. And some of you are sitting there thinking, what in the world is that wreath doing in church? I'm not even sure that thing is Christian. Well, the Advent wreath has a long history within church not just the Catholic Church or not just the Protestant Church. It goes back to the 6th century, actually, when the church realized that the Advent wasn't just so much about the coming of Jesus the first time, it was the Advent of Jesus the second time. And so the church tried to figure out a way, the best way to mark this coming of Jesus the second time, and they came up with the idea of this wreath, which is now the incarnation of what we have now, a time to slow folks down to help them prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Back in 1839, a Protestant pastor in Germany, Johann Henrik Wickern, he worked a lot with impoverished children in his community. Of 
course, children, as they get closer to Christmas, can't wait. We've all been there. We have children. We know exactly what that's about. They get so excited they, that they want to get to Christmas now, even though today we're still four weeks away. Well, he decided that what he was going to do was help them to slow down a bit with this idea of this Advent wreath. So he ha had a wooden circle, a wooden wreath, and he put 19 small red candles around the four larger candles. And each day he would light one candle. One candle at a time to slow the children down. And it worked. They didn't rush. And as we gather around the Advent candle, we don't rush. We shouldn't rush either. For we have four weeks to help us prepare to get there. And the Advent wreath that Pastor Wykern had has evolved to what we have now. His wooden wreath is now ours, which is greenery. It is evergreens, which symbolizes life, which symbolizes everlasting life. It's a circular, it's, it's a wreath, which symbolizes the crown for the king, for victory. The four candles that we have on the outside represent the four Sundays, the four themes that lead up to Advent, to Christmas Day, and the beautiful white candle in the middle. It's the light of Christ. And as you notice as in the coming weeks, we're going to continue to light the candles each week. The light on the wreath will get brighter and brighter and brighter as we get to the birth of Christ. The light chasing the darkness away. Until on Christmas Eve, we light the center candle, the light of Christ, and our Advent wreath is full of glory as we celebrate the birth of our Savior together. Today's theme, of course, is hope. Hope for people of the Bible is basically what it's all about, isn't it? All throughout Scripture, we have this idea of hope from the very first day of creation to this day that we live in now. And hope is what we need as humans for a healthy existence. For if we don't have hope, what is there to live for? Many years ago, scientists gathered two large groups of rats to try to do this experiment to see exactly what hope would be about with these animals. So with one group of rats, they took them and they placed them in this large tub of water to see what they would do, to see how they would react in a time of great distress. They left them alone to their own devices, and pretty soon the rats, one by one by one, started to drown until literally after 24 hours, all the rats had, had died. Well, then they took the second batch of rats, put them in a similar tub of empty water, dumped them in there. 30 minutes later, though, they scooped them out, put them in a pen for a minute, then dumped that pen back into the water. Let them swim around, try to survive for another hour, scooped them out, put them in a pen, gave them another minute rest, then dumped them back in the water. Then they left them in there for about three hours, scooped them up, let them in the pen, let them dry out for a minute, then dumped them back into the water. Those rats continued to live for over 24 hours because they had hope that they would be scooped out, put in the pen to live to see a further day. How many of us have been like those rats in the water struggling, left to our own devices without any hope? wanting to give up. But then all of a sudden, something comes in to scoop us out, to put us, even just for one minute, on some dry land to give us hope. As people of faith, we understand that, that hope is found in Scripture. Hope is found in God. Hope is found in Jesus. It is being rescued and receiving salvation forever. In the Old Testament, hope is defined by two words in Hebrew, Yachal and Chava. Yachal is the hope that we have when we wait for. We wait for something. Noah, when he and his family were on the ark, they yachaled for the floodwaters to recede so that they could be back on dry land. Isaiah, the prophet, wrote about God being a planter who would plant grape seeds to further vineyards to grow. And when he planted those seeds, he had the yachal kind of hope, 
so that it was an anticipation that growth would happen. He waited and he hoped with great anticipation. That's the hope, the hope that we have in the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament, our hope is not found only in God, but found in the person of Jesus Christ. And the hope that translated from the Greek is elpis. And that elpis hope that we have is not just for individuals, although we have made it a very individual hope of salvation, but the hope that Jesus brought to the earth was for all of creation. Not just for me, not just for you, but for all of creation. That all of creation would be the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Now we all have hope. We all hope yesterday that our team was going to win. We have hope that tomorrow is going to be a good day. We hope that whatever is cooked for dinner tonight is going to taste yummy. It's a very generic type of hope where we get, kind of give ourselves into the circumstances and we hope that everything is going to work out in whatever way things are going to work out. But the biblical hope that we have, the biblical hope is not based on just circumstances. It is based on individual, God and Christ. That the hope that the people of God had in the Old Testament was on God that God would deliver them, God would take them out of the land of Egypt into the promised land, that God would be with them forever and ever. And no matter what that they did, and they did, God would continue to be their God. Jump to the New Testament. We have Jesus, the incarnation of God, the Christ child, who gives us hope, not only in how we are to live, but who has come to take away our sin, to come, who has come to banish death, to banish the darkness, so that we might have light, we might have hope, we might have life. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. I don't know about your house, but my house is already decorated for Christmas. The tree is up, the mantle is hung with all six stockings. We're ready, but we still have four weeks. We have to wait for Christmas to get here. Now, we could go ahead and open the present under the tree, but I'll be honest, there are no presents under the tree right now. We still have some work to do in my house. I don't know about your house. But we have that time to get ready because there is so much to do, isn't there? As we get ready for Christmas Day, we have to shop. We have to make lists. We have to clean house. We have to plan whether we're going to go see Grandma or whether the kids are going to come see us. We have to decide, are we going to go to that party this year or are we going to send our regrets? Are we going to host that party this year or are we going to take a year off? We have to figure out, are we going to do on Christmas Eve? Are we going to make reservations somewhere? If so, we better do it quickly because it's already too late. Or are we going to try to find something to cook at home? There's so much to do as we wait for Christmas, and that's just on the external. But what about inside? What about the work that we're going to do inside as we wait for the hope, the peace, and the joy, and the love that we find in the manger? That's part of what this Advent wreath is about. It's about that first Advent, preparing us for the birth of Jesus the Christ. But it's also about the second Advent, the second coming of Christ, which we have been promised will come. But unlike Christmas, we don't know when. As I stated earlier, I looked at the calendar this morning, and Christmas this year is going to be on December the 25th. It's on my calendar for that day. But the second coming of Christ, I can't find it. I can't find it in my Google calendar anywhere. And so we wait. We wait for that second coming. And so what are we going to do as we wait? Are we just going to keep doing the normal stuff, knowing that at some point it's going to come, kind of like Christmas, we know it's the 25th this year. Are we going to do the other stuff, though, to get ready for it? Are we going to do the shopping? <clears throat> Excuse me. Are we going to take care of the external things as we also take care of the internal things, preparing ourselves for the coming of Jesus? Or are we just going to kind of, hmm, Christmas is coming. The goose might be getting fat. The 26th is just going to be the day after. We have a choice that we have to make as we wait for the second advent of Christ. Are we just going to live normally? Or are we going to take to heart the first advent 
and what the first advent meant for us and for the world and live in the way of Christ, to follow his example and to try our best to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth? Are we going to treat our neighbor with love like we try to love ourselves? Are we going to serve others first and put ourselves second? Are we going to seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? Are we going to seek God first in everything that we do? Not just the churchy God stuff, but everything we do. Are we going to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind? Not just on Sundays when we light the big candles, but every day and everywhere we might find ourselves. That's how we wait for the second coming. That's how we wait as we were reminded each week that the light grows brighter and brighter, chasing that darkness away. For we do live in a very dark world. And we, as people of faith, have been given that light to shine. And so what are we going to do with that light? Are we going to do anything with it? Just let Christmas come? Or are we going to work that light and shine it so that others might see? so that others might experience the advent that we are also experiencing. We've got time. We've got four weeks. We've got to wait. But we also have to get busy. So may we wait actively for the coming of the Lord. Amen.
you are the people of God, having given your best to the Lord today through prayer, through song, and through word. May we all go from this place and be doers of the word and not hearers only. Go with God's love, go with God's grace, and go with God's peace. Amen.